coming through loud enough back there? Thank you. We welcome you to uh, this auditorium class. I know uh, Brother Ernie Fouts and I had a series of good uh, worship services at the uh, jail already this morning. We had uh, one response, a member from the Jumpertown congregation uh, repented of sins and asked us to to pray for him, and I've called the Jumpertown preacher and uh, shared that so he could share it with the congregation out there. Um, I've got several on our sick list. I've got uh, Dorothy Stanford is back at Landmark. Uh, Sue Glenn is at home now. Craig Glenn is doing better and may even be able to come back home this week. Uh, Maggie Hester, who's in Cornerstone in Corinth, is doing better. She's actually uh, accepting visitors now, and I know we've had some that have gone up to see her. Uh, Randy Moore is doing good following his surgery. We need to continue to remember Paula Warner and June Cupper. Um, Allison Wade, who is a kin folks to a Jones & Jones employee and lives in Alabama, uh, and needs a double lung transplant. We've been asked to remember her in our prayers. Um, I do not have an update on Christopher Harris who had the heart transplant. Does anybody have an update on him? Are there others that we need to uh, remember in our prayer this morning? Jim, we had uh, a couple of baptisms in the prison ministry, one in Flowood, and one in Perth. Two baptisms uh, through our jail ministry that's linked through our correspondence courses. I know we we just need to be thankful for the outpouring of love to the Gerald Gray family. I, I thought uh, the food that was brought for the meal you know, just had so many names there of people who were helping out. We're so thankful for that. And, and if you were just to think about that list of names that I was talking about, many of those we've been praying for and have shown improvement. We're so thankful to God for that. that you would be with uh, Dorothy Stanford, Sue Glenn, Craig Glenn, Maggie Hester, Randy Moore, Paula Warner, June Cupper, Allison Wade, 
Christopher Harris, and John Wesley Copeland. And Father, we pray that you would be with us uh, in this study today. We pray that you would help us as we open your word to have a deeper understanding of it and give us the wisdom to apply it. We love you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Just in uh, terms of, of uh, adult classes, let me mention before we get started in our lesson today that uh, next week, since some of the Golden Circle are still going to be on our trip, we are planning on being uh, worshiping at the Kimball, Tennessee Church of Christ Sunday morning. Should be back here for worship uh, Sunday night, but in my absence, Brother Jeremy Jones will teach another lesson in this series on worship. Uh, the week after that, we'll be in our preliminaries for the Campaign for Christ, and Steve Higginbotham will have the class in here. The week after that, uh, Brother Tommy Barragona will teach a lesson in here. Uh, I have asked him to look at maybe two weeks since I'm having surgery during that time period and didn't know if I would be able to cover that second week. Uh, and then... The Sunday after that, Brother Ralph Gilmore is going to be here. That Sunday the 14th, I believe it is, of October, we're having the Freed Hardeman Chorale here, and we'll have a, a special day kind of format, and Brother Ralph Gilmore will teach the Sunday school class and have the morning lesson. And so we'll get back into the questions that you asked, Lord willing, uh, in the middle of, of October. But uh, I'm, hopefully we're going to to finish what we had planned to cover today on the question of this doctrine of once saved, always saved. We know that there are a lot of very sincere people that believe that that's what the Bible says. And, and we know, like the people in Berea, that we need to open the scriptures and search and make sure that what we're being told is so. And we... Last week, we looked at uh, several of Jesus' kingdom parables. We know that Jesus used the term kingdom and church interchangeably there in Matthew, the 16th chapter. And in several of his teachings while he was here, he said, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like. And we saw that in, some, in most of those parables, we were being instructed that to live righteously while we're here on this earth. And, and there were actually examples of people that were in the kingdom that did not live righteously and ultimately did not receive the, the reward. I, I would like for us today to, to start by going over into Revelation. In Revelation, the third chapter, there are uh, two references to different congregations that I think are applicable to this study. One of which is the in his conversation to the church in Laodicea. Uh, that begins in Revelation, the third chapter, verse 14. I call your attention to verse 15. I know your works that you are neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And it goes on to talk about that. And in every one of these letters, each of these seven letters in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 ends with an appeal to repent and a, a promise of some kind of reward. But the fact that, that Jesus is saying to the Christians in this congregation that you make me nauseous by your lack of, in, of being totally dedicated to my word or to my church, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. We know from Acts, the second chapter, that when those people there, when the 3,000 of them did what Peter said in Acts 2 and verse 38, 
that the Lord added them to the church there in Acts 2 and verse 47. And so if the Lord adds people to the church, the Lord can take people out of the church. And when he says, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth, that's a very graphic picture of people who were saved that are ultimately going to be lost unless they repent. Now, if you go back and uh, look at uh, Revelation, the third chapter, where he's talking to the church in Sardis. The church in Sardis is an interesting congregation because most of the people had gotten involved in sin, had contaminated their garments. Uh, it is said that you, you do have a few in the congregation that haven't done that, and he uses the term worthy. These are worthy, but most of the people were unworthy. Then in verse 5 he says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father, and before his angels. So here we have a congregation who have most of their membership needs to be repenting or overcoming sin. The term overcoming is, uh, is synonymous with repenting and turning back to, to being on the right track. So you've got a congregation here that by implication are going to have him blot out their names out of the book of life. Once saved, always saved. Well, why would he even talk about blotting a name out if there were no possibility of being lost? You know, we looked last week at Romans the 8th chapter. You know, who can separate us from the love of God? And then a whole list of things that could separate us from the love of God. But if our behavior is such that we contaminate our spiritual garments, then what Jesus is saying to the church in Sardis and to the church in Boonville by implication is if we contaminate our spiritual garments, Jesus is willing, not only willing, but will, unless we repent, blot our names out of the book of life. I thought those, uh, those two references in Revelation were rather powerful. And if I were talking with someone who sincerely believed that the Bible teaches once saved, always saved, that's one of the areas that I think I would, would talk about. Now, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew the seventh chapter, and verse 22, he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. You, you have probably heard me in other classes talk about Matthew, the seventh chapter, the end of this particular chapter. Because, you know, I believe this is a judgment day scene. And you've got people there on judgment day and, and they're pleading their case. And they're calling Jesus Lord. And if they're calling Jesus Lord, they are calling themselves Christians. Not only do they do that, but they list, have we not? And they start listing these religious kinds of activities that they've done. And Jesus goes on to tell them, that he that doeth the will of my Father in heaven will be saved. You know, he, he says, I never knew you. Why did he not know you? Because they had been inventing their own religious practices, not following what he said to do. Jesus teaches something different than once saved, always saved. I think probably another one of his more powerful areas of this 
is found in John, the 15th chapter, the Gospel according to John, chapter 15. Now let's, let's just read verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it might bring forth more fruit. By the way, how does a person become one of those branches? How does a person get into Christ? He gets there when he is baptized. For as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Paul talks about this in Galatians 3rd chapter as well as in Romans the 6th chapter. So we're talking about people who have, as in Acts 2.47 says, been added to the church. In verse 3, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. When you tell a person to abide in something, they have to first be in it to abide in it. And so if we're talking about people who are in Christ or people who are in the church and they're being instructed by Jesus to abide in the church, there has to be the possibility for them to not abide in the church. Otherwise, the instructions would have been sort of ridiculous to give. Then he goes on to say, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. All right, if we've established that people that he's talking about here, individual Christians that are in him, and one of the main arguments that I've heard from people who espouse this once saved, always saved, is that if you encounter a person that has done what's called backsliding, you may hear the comment, well, they were never saved anyway. But yet Jesus' teaching here contradicts that concept because Jesus is teaching if, you abide in me, that you're going to get all of these rewards. If you do not abide in me, in other words, you that were once saved, if you become sinful again, you turn back and you're working for the devil, you got some consequences that are going to be paid. He, he talks here about the, those branches being cut off and, and thrown into the fire. It's a very graphic picture uh, that's very similar to what he talks about there in Matthew chapter 25 where he was talking about those people that didn't feed the hungry and didn't clothe the naked, etc. Cast ye those people into outer darkness. People in the church are expected to bear fruit. We studied about uh, the parable of the talents and how the one person with one talent was cast into outer darkness. You know, not only are we supposed to be in Christ, we are supposed to be in Christ 
and bearing fruit in Christ. And, and Jesus here in this discussion about the vine and the branches couldn't be any clearer that the doctrine of once saved, always saved is a doctrine of men. I would go even beyond that. I would say it's a doctrine of the devil because we give people a terrible false sense of security by telling them all you got to do is hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized and you're home free. We're not home free. We have just decided that we're going to be slaves for Christ. We're, we have decided that, that now we're ready to go to work. Now we're ready to bear fruit for the Lord. And if we don't carry through, and as Revelation 2.10 talks about, be faithful unto death, then what Jesus is saying here in John 15, 1 through 8, is exactly what our future is going to be. <clears throat> we didn't talk about the parable of the ten virgins that are, is found in, in Matthew 10, verses 10 through 13. I'm not going to go into that one in detail, but I think that one of the learnings that we can get is if we are not prepared when the Lord comes, there aren't second chances. And that's probably another lesson that we could have on the doctrine of purgatory. But our, our opportunity to serve the Lord and to be considered worthy, like some of those people at the church in Sardis were, is while we're alive and here on earth, there is not a second chance opportunity. Now, not only did Jesus teach that we need to be faithful unto death, the apostles taught the same thing. Uh, I was just looking at some of the various writings. Uh, consider what Peter said in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Certainly Peter was well qualified to counsel us about not slipping up. Uh, Peter was our yo-yo man. He denied Christ three times, but then repented. He was different than Judas, who, became, who was also sorrowful, but then he went into depression and killed himself. Peter repented and became a great servant. And, and what better person to tell us about not slipping up than Peter himself, and to tell us, you know, Jesus had said that Satan wants to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you. And it'd be great to know that Jesus was praying for us, that we would uh, follow the instru same instructions that Joshua was given in Joshua the first chapter, be strong and courageous, and focus on what, I, what the law says. We need to be strong and courageous. We need to put on the whole armor of God and having done all to stand. Peter in, the, in 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22 said, If after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now how do you escape the pollution of the world? By obeying the gospel. I think back to uh, Saul of Tarsus. When Ananias came to him in Acts 22 and verse 16, and he said, Now why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized and do what? Wash away your sins. He escaped the pollution of the world by the blood of Jesus Christ washing that sins away. How do we continue to have our sins washed away? By walking in the light. That's what John said. If we continue to walk in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse us of our sins. So these are people 
who have escaped the pollution of the world. The only way to escape the pollution of the world is through the blood of Jesus Christ. For if after you have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled themselves and overcome. So many times in those seven letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and verse 3, Jesus uses this word overcome. He wants us to overcome. He wants us to overcome. He doesn't want the devil to overcome us, but these people have let the devil overcome them again. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to his vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. I can't think of two better descriptions of repulsive behavior than what he's talking about here when Christians give up walking in the light and go back and start following the devil again and how hard it is sometimes to bring them back and you probably have loved ones I know that we've got fellow Christians that we love dearly that are not with us today because they have done exactly what Peter was talking about here they've been overcome with sin they're like that dog that has vomited and is now eating his own vomit what a terrible repulsive picture. Why would the Holy Spirit paint such a picture? Is it because there's once saved, always saved? I don't think so. He's painting such a repulsive picture so that we won't allow ourselves to get caught up in sin like that. Now if we look at the Apostle Paul in, in 1 Corinthians the 6th chapter, um, the church in Corinth, you know, when we studied 1 Corinthians, it was one problem right after another. Starting out with not having unity in the congregation, and you can just, almost every chapter is a new problem. Well, there's a problem in 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, that he talks about. But brother goeth to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now therefore... It is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you rather ex why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He's talking to Christians here and he's put up a big mirror before them and he's told these Christians that your behavior is unrighteous behavior and then he tells them, do you not know that unrighteous people are not going to go to heaven? He's talking to Christians here and he's warning them not to be unrighteous. Then he expands his words. And he says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And he goes back and he reminds them, and such were some of you. This is what you were. Why are you moving back into what you were? You escaped the corruption of the world. Now, why in the world go back? But, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You can look at a lot of the letters of Paul and, and, and you're going to find similar kind of teaching. Let's go to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, it's a similar teaching beginning in verse 3. 
But fornication and all uncleanness or covetous lips, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are fitting, but rather giving, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. I call your attention to that phrase, let no one deceive you with empty words. I would call this doctrine of once saved, always saved, an example of empty words. Because if you tell a person that, you know, if you've put on Christ in your heart, you've asked Christ to come into your heart, you have been saved and nothing is going to take you away from this. So what if you uh, sin from day to day? Nothing is powerful enough to take you away. After all, it says the Holy Spirit has sealed you. That is empty words. He has just specified that all of these people who are doing these kinds of sins are going to be subject to the wrath of God. He says, therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to God. Do you remember when Jesus uh, brought those little children to him? It's talked about in Matthew, the 18th chapter, in verse 6. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. We have got all of this instructions about how important it is that we keep sin out of our lives once we have become part of the family of God. And if people come out and tell you that, well, that's really not as important as these folks over at the Boonville Church of Christ are saying that it is, or even stronger than that, it's really not important even though the Bible says that it is. What you have found is, it's like these people that are causing these little children to be lost. And the condemnation upon people who teach false doctrine and cause people to be lost is tremendous. Paul said in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verses 16 through 26, a whole lot that help us to understand that our behavior needs to be consistent with the fruit of the Spirit and not like the works of the flesh. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lust, for the flesh lust against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law, for the works of the flesh are evident. And, and you know, he's listed a whole lot of those. And he ends that with that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. How many warnings do we have to have before we understand that God wants us to run away from sin? He wants us to be like Joseph. And when somebody is trying to entice us into an inappropriate sexual relationship, we ought to run, run as fast as we can away from that. Who did Paul say had forsaken, this, had forsaken him, having loved this present world? De Demas. 
Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now, at other places, Demas is called a fellow worker. I mean, he was right there with Paul, active with Paul, and then his behavior changed. He was a faithful Christian, and then he was not. He was like one of those people that Jesus talked about in the parable of the sower. He had let the cares of the world overtake him. Now, Paul in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, and verse 27, uses an interesting word. And uh, I'm sure if Brother Stephen Hodgen, as much as he likes words, if he were teaching this class, he'd probably have a, a big section on this particular word. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself become disqualified. There's another place that he uses this word, and that's in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, where he said, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. I was watching the Mississippi State-Kansas State football game yesterday. I did like the outcome. But what I saw in there is there was a Mississippi State player that uh, we might call him in, in olden times a headhunter. He tackled one of the Kansas State players and he hit his helmet with his head. In football, what do they call, call that now? Targeting. They pulled out the flag, threw the, threw the flag, blew the whistle, stopped the play, cranked up the video replay. It was interesting to me that video replay did confirm that this offense was targeting. 15-yard penalty, and they called out the player's number you know what they said he was? Disqualified. Disqualified. He had been an active member of the team. And yet now, he is disqualified. Paul is warning in these two places. One place we ought to examine ourselves unless we're disqualified. The other, he's saying, you know, I, will, I look out for myself. I guard myself. Lest after I've taught all these other people, I become disqualified myself. Because the Holy Spirit instructed him to use that word disqualified. It means that the doctrine of once saved, always saved is a false doctrine. The reason it is a false doctrine is you cannot become disqualified unless you were once qualified. It's pretty clear. In Romans, the first chapter, in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Paul was talking about people that rejected all the evidence. In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 8, Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth men, the truth men of corrupt mind, disapprove concerning the faith. He's talking here uh, about people in the church that ultimately start taking the church off in a wrong direction. And they, 
where they once were in the faith, now they're disapproved in the faith. In Titus 1, in verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. You know, that's one of the things that elders have to watch out for, are people who, that, who were faithful in the church, but then transition out. It's bad when they transition away from God, but it's even worse when they try to pull other people with them. In Hebrews 6, verses 7 and 8, For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. The Hebrew writer you know, focuses on how important it is for us to remain faithful. You'll remember the cloud of witnesses in Hebrews chapter 11, and, and then in chapter 12 when it talks about the we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and that ought to be motivation to us to run the race that is laid out before us keeping in mind who our leader is and the reward that is there for us. It's not once saved, always saved. It's once saved and then serve the Lord for the rest of our lives. John said in 2 John 1 and verse 9, Whoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God, but he who abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews 10, we use Hebrews 10.25 a lot to reinforce the fact that we ought to be a, a, a faithful in our attendance. But I want us to go all the way through verse 27. In verse 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as the, you see the day approaching. Now why should we do that? For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. On Judgment Day, my prayer is that each of us will be called worthy. My prayer is that we will hear those glorious words, Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. My prayer is that we'll be able to sit around the throne and sing praises to God through eternity. And we can have hope of doing that first by taking advantage of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ so that we get rid of all of that sin that we had and, and, and we can continue to, to walk in the light as He's in the light. And we, we need to take the admonition that was given in Revelation 2 and verse 10 to be faithful unto death because we know that if we do that He will give us a crown of life. May God bless you. Thank you.